Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, if I mailed you some of uh, the SD cards or USB drives, uh, if you don't get it in, you know, 10 days, let me know. Mail's been really weird lately. It's like... Sometimes I get stuff in two or three days, and then other times it's well over a week. So, um, you know, when I get, when everybody sends me something, I mean, it's uh, that night I copy everything, and then the next day it goes out in the mail. So, I don't know. Uh, all right, in the last Bible study, I finished up the uh, the trumpets. Uh, trumpets were used as a call for the uh, people to assemble before the Lord, a gathering together. It was also used to warn of an, an enemy army approaching, and it was also used as a battle cry. Well, guess what? That makes total sense when you get to the book of Revelation and there are seven trumps or trumpets blown. You know, the church is gathered. There's a battle. The Lord's battling the uh, armies of the earth. Uh, it's kind of a lopsided battle, but uh, it's a battle nonetheless. And uh, like I say, we're gathered. The church will be gathered together unto him. All right, so let's see. What is the next? I think the next one's the Day of Atonement. So let's take a look at the Day of Atonement. All right, we're going to be talking about the Day of Atonement, which is one of God's holy days. And when you break the word down, Atonement, it's basically at, A-T, O-N-E, at one, and then ment, M-E-N-T. Uh, it's what is known as a suffix, uh, forming nouns expressing the means or result of an action. Forming nouns from adjectives. Uh, for example... If you talked about uh, there was an oil spill and we it had it had to go into containment. Well, contain means you keep the spill in a certain place to keep it from spreading. So contain, contain meant, meant. Uh, for example, I am retired. I am in retirement. Retirement. Um, uh, let's see, if you were to give somebody some drinks and say, oh, would you like some refreshments? So, you know, or if you paid somebody, oh, I had to give him his payment. So I hope I'm conveying the idea of what M-E-N-T means. Movement, you know, movement. So, changing a position. So, what is atonement? At one meant with God. If you are in Christ and you have his spirit, there will come a time you will be at one meant, if not already, with the Lord. Now, the uh, Day of Atonement was a day of fasting and prayer. It was a day to afflict your souls. So, it came after the Feast of Tabernacles. So, guess what? 
the um, if we hold this to the New Testament, it would appear that at the seventh trump, when the Lord returns, that will be the day that we are at one meant atonement with, with the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, it was a day of fasting and prayer. I suspect that in the New Testament, when the Lord returns at the seventh trump and the enemies are put under his feet and destroyed, uh, it will be, I'm guessing now, I'm guessing. I suppose it will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. There will be no more need for fasting and prayer. Well, there'll be need for prayer, but uh, probably not fasting. You know, that was what you did back in the sinful flesh. Well, as I did in the last study, our corruptible flesh is going to be raised as incorruptible spirit, spirit body, a celestial, heavenly type body. And if you didn't uh, do... What was it, part? I forgot. I think it was part four. I just loaded it today. Today is uh, November 28, 2020. Saturday. So, huh. Uh, yeah, Saturday was named for Saturn. Saturn Day. One of the Greco-Roman gods. And coincidentally, it is the sixth planet from the sun. I did a Bible study on this recently. So, let's read about the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. Uh, forgive me, I need to define atonement. It's a noun. It means agreement or reconciliation after enmity or controversy, this is from Noah Webster, uh, satisfaction or reparation made by giving an equivalent for an injury or by doing or suffering that which is received in satisfaction for an offense or injury. Um, Let's see, in Leviticus 9, 7, And Moses said to Aaron, Go to the altar and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering, and make an atonement for thyself and for the people. Now, this is Webster's 1828, which, like I say, I guy was a believer and a linguist, a, a language scholar. He knew Bible languages. He knew them. Oh, yeah. And just the fact that he uses uh, the uh, Bible scriptures where the word appears that he's defining is unbelievable in my eye, you know, my eyes. Uh, for example, uh, let's see. It says, when a man has been guilty of any vice, the best atonement he can make for it is to warn others not to fall into the like. Uh, in theology, here we go. The expiation of sin made by the obedience and personal sufferings of Christ. So, in other words, uh, Christ made a reconciliation between God the Father and mankind by his sinless life, death, death burial and resurrection you know we couldn't pay the price so christ paid it for us which is a lot easier to just believe on the lord and than uh than doing all these little ritual sacrifice things and all these little stupid little laws that the hebrew roots people want you to get into uh-uh i don't think so so no thank you uh, something people I'm going to mention. In the book of Ezekiel, there's going to be 
Ezekiel's temple. There is actually going to be a temple, and if memory serves me correctly, there is actually going to be animal sacrifice in God's kingdom. When Christ, you know, when Christ returns in glory, and people are like, "Wait a minute! Christ paid the the, the price. There's no need for a temple." Well, for those that are born of the Holy Spirit, uh, that is true. Now, the Bible records that in the resurrection, Jesus said, in the resurrection, there is neither marriage nor giving in marriage, but we are as the angels in heaven. But yet, I forget if it's Isaiah or Ezekiel, it records now, I did a Bible study on this. It's called Children in the Kingdom. There's going to be children playing at the, the hole of the asp, which is a very deadly snake, serpent, very dangerous. And it's not, they're not going to be hurt. Lions are going to be eating like straw. Last I checked with National Geographic, the lions are still not eating straw. So, if lions are eating straw and children are in the kingdom and they're playing with poisonous vipers and they're not being hurt and believers can't be married and having children, where do these children come from? Well, Chaplain Bob, that's a... Wow, do you have an answer to that? That's a good question. Well, I would suspect that all those children that were aborted... Children that died in childbirth or died be below a certain age, what some churches call the age of accountability, I believe that they will be given bodies and given a chance to grow up without Satan, bound during the thousand years. And they'll probably be taught by people, you know, either... Angels or Bible teachers, I don't know. And, uh, and then at the end of a thousand years, for a season, Satan's released. He goes out into the world, starts another rebellion. Uh, some of these people will not be saved. They will fight against the Lord. Fire comes down from heaven and wipes them out. And then... The thousand-year millennium is done. Then it's the white throne judgment. I'm just doing a quick overview here. I mean, I could spend hours and hours doing a Bible study on what I just talked about. But honestly, I don't think it's that important now. The important thing now is to have people not take the mark of the beast don't worship the beast. Know that the beast comes before Christ and that Christ comes at the end of the tribulation, not before. Unlike what all the evil churches are teaching. You ever heard of John Nelson Darby? Uh, him and Edward Irving, along with Schofield, well, Irving and, and Darby were in England, or the United Kingdom, I should say. And uh, Schofield took their flawed theological trash and popularized it here in the United States. Darby, uh, I, from what I've read, he got his information from a lass called Mary MacDonald, Scottish lass, which is, you know, a young lady for all you um, Americans. The Brits know what I'm talking about when I say a, a lass. But uh, Darby, his family owned Leap Castle in, I think it's Ireland. Uh, I keep forgetting if it's Ireland or Scotland, but I, I'm pretty sure it's Ireland. Uh, according to their tourism, Leap Castle is the most haunted castle in Ireland. I wonder how many seances the Darby family had in that castle. 
You ever heard the expression, birds of a feather flock together? That's in the Bible, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Leap Castle, Darby family. And of course, the uh, pre-tribbers don't want to hear that little piece of history. You know, I mean, if he was such a godly man, why didn't he cast the devils out of his castle? And I have no doubt that castle's haunted. No doubt. Not one doubt in my mind. We have a saying here in America, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. All right, so. Uh, let's see, atonement. Reconciling ourselves back to God via Christ. Now, I do not want to make this a really, really long uh, thing. But in the Old Testament, if you want to read, you can read uh, Exodus chapter 29, verses 33, verse 36, verse 37. Exodus 30 and verse 10. Now, well, let's read that one. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it. Remember my last Bible study? We did the uh, tabernacle series about the, the horns on the altar, the four horns. Well, this is what this is. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations it is most holy unto the Lord. So, very important back then. Now, we've got, instead of a blood of a bull, we got the blood of Christ, which is a lot better. You can read Leviticus and uh, compare that with uh, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is the New Testament equivalent of the book of Leviticus. Leviticus was the uh, book for the priests. Temple, or uh, not temple, but uh, the temple came later. But tabernacle worship for the priests, the Levites. That's why it's called Leviticus, Levi. The Le Levitical priesthood, of which Moses and Aaron were both of that particular tribe. There were 12 tribes. Sorry, not everybody was a Jew. Only Judah could properly be called a Jew. So, and people will try to confuse you and say, well, you know, uh, Judah is Israel and Israel's Jews. Well, that's not true. The United States has 50 states. If you're an American citizen, you're probably a resident of one of the 50 states. If you're a Texan, you're an American. If you're a Californian, American. Floridian, Te American. American. New Yorker, American. New Jersey, American. Okay? Not everybody is from Texas. Well, not everybody was from Judah. There was 11 other tribes, people. You know, everybody, a true Judah is an Israelite, but not all the Israelites were of Judah. You had the Levites. You had the tribe of Gad. You had the tribe of Dan. You had the tribe of Ephraim, the Manasseh. Uh, Naphtali. Uh, I could probably go think of them all, but I hope you get the idea. Only the Levites were to be the priests and serve the Lord in the tabernacle. That was their job. All right, let's take a look at Leviticus 23 and verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you. All right, what is a convocation? 
Noun, Latin. Webster's 1828. The act of calling or assembling by summons. Uh, if you got a summons to appear in court, that would be a convocation. Uh, an assembly. And he quotes Exodus 12, 16. Uh, in England, an assembly of the clergy by their representatives to consult on ecclesiastical affairs. It is held during the session of Parliament and consists of an upper and lower house. Uh, so, yeah. An academical, academical assembly in which the business of the university is transacted. So, it's the assembling or gathering together of God's people, Israel. That's what it's all about. All right, so. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, a holy assembling. And ye shall afflict your souls, fasting and prayer, right? And offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day. For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whosoever soul, I'm sorry, for whatsoever soul it be that shall not afflict, shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Well, guess what? New Testament uh, application. If you're not at one with the Lord and the Holy Spirit, you're going to be cut off from the Lord. Lake of fire, right? Yeah. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. All right, uh, atone, A-T-O-N-E. Um, to stand as an equivalent to make reparation, amends, or satisfaction for an offense or a crime by which reconciliation is procured between the offended and offending parties. Let's say you were playing baseball with the kids and one of the kids hit a, a home run and it went through the neighbor's window. And all the kids got together and uh, got some money together and paid a repairman to come and fix the window. That would be atoning for a wrong. Well, we have wronged the Lord. Uh, sin is transgression of the law the breaking of the law and Christ is our atoning work I hope uh, I've made that clear so you know these uh, today these are uncommon words that's why I'm spending so much time uh, giving you definitions so now remember, the Day of Atonement came after the, the Holy Day of Trumpets. So in the Old Testament, it was a day of fasting and prayer and making amends. But in the New Testament, believers with the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit, um, after the seven trumpets, Christ returns I suspect instead of being a day of fasting and prayer and afflicting your souls, 
it's going to probably end up being a day of feasting, not fasting, feasting. Uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what I am guessing. And if I'm wrong, I hope the Lord will forgive me, but that's, that's what I suspect. All right, let's go to the New Testament. We are going to read Romans chapter 5. People that, uh, I don't know how people can read this and think, oh, Paul was a false apostle. I, I just don't get it. Well, I do. They're, uh, they don't know, they don't know Paul and they don't know who sent Paul, which was Christ. And they don't know God the Father that sent Christ. So, verse 5, chapter 5, Romans 1, oh, psh, boy, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, getting ahead of myself there. Therefore, being justified by faith, oh, but I want to do Hebrew roots, chaplain, Bob. I want to uh, have the you-know-whos rebuild the temple so we can take animals there and, and keep all these 600 and something laws. Well, you go for it, dog, because I'm going to pass on that. You can keep all the laws you want to. Oh, by the way, did you uh, do the soldier's ransom? Oh, you don't even know what the soldier's ransom is, so you didn't do it. Uh, well, you broke one of the laws, so guess what? You're condemned. Uh, so you can keep your Hebrew roots. I want Greek fruits, F-R-U-I-T-S. You can have your Hebrew roots. I want the Greek fruits. Because guess what? The New Testament was written in Greek. And there's only fruit uh, in the New Testament. There is no fruit in the Old Testament. Well, maybe rotten fruit. Uh, well, there's nothing wrong with the Old Testament's covenant. But as sinful flesh, we couldn't keep it. But if all these Hebrew roots people think that their sinful flesh is going to be able to keep God's old covenant, uh, well, they're insane. Now, I'd rather be justified by faith. Romans 1, 5, I'm sorry, Romans 5, cha uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Yeah. Yeah, I want patience. Yeah, Lord, send me patience and I want it now. Right? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, you can either have the Holy Ghost or you can have 600 and something laws that you can keep. I think I'll prefer the Holy Ghost, but... That's just me. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Boy, that's me. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Romans 5.8. This is a wonderful verse. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's a memory verse right there. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
much more than being now justified by his blood, not by keeping 600 and something laws, no, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Oh, let's read that again. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, the at one with God, right? Verse 12. How can anybody read this and think Paul is a false apostle? Oh, that's right. They're devils. Never mind. They're devils, not Paul. Verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, death passed upon all men. And since women came from the side of man, that's why they're called woman. So when you talk about man or mankind, that includes women or womankind. See, this is why the virgin birth is so important in your Bible. Adam and Eve had sin nature, corrupted. Their DNA was corrupted by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So, does all mean all? Well, all that came from Adam, yes. All have sinned. But the thing is, and a lot of people will argue with me, I do not believe that Mary was DNA was used for Christ. He's called the last Adam. He had the same mother and father as the first Adam, God the Father. That's my opinion. Because if Mary's DNA was used, then Christ was uh, probably would have been corrupted with sin nature, the same as Mary. Mary was afflicted with the same sin nature that we all were. So it says, for, all, for that all have sinned. Does that mean Jesus sinned? Uh, no. So all does not always mean all. Keep that in mind. I know that people will point out and say, oh, all, the Lord wants all to be saved. Really? Does all mean all? How about Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Did Jesus sin and come short of the glory of God? Oh, but it says all. All means all. I don't think so. So did Jesus sin? Is he part of this all? No, absolutely not. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, and who is that? That is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Ah, that's, that's our great high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Profession of what? Our profession of faith. Verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched 
with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Christ was without sin. So all does not always mean all. It means all that were born of women of Adam. We all were born in sin. But Christ, that's why the virgin birth is so important. Christ was born without sin, and he never sinned. But was in all points tempted like as we were, yet without sin. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Ah, oh, okay, that makes sense. So all doesn't mean all. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. What does that mean? Who was given the law? Who was given the commandments of God? Israel. Israel was given the law. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where, when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Well, that gift for us is free, uh, but it cost Christ everything. Well, in the flesh, anyways. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness, the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. How can anybody read this stuff and think Paul is a false apostle? They must, they're devils. They can't, they, they don't have the spirit of God. They can't, they just, they got the spirit of the devil. How can you not read this and, and see? Verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So, in the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement was a day of fasting and prayer. In the New Testament, I think the Day of Atonement is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right, let's go to the book of John, chapter 2, verse 1. 
And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now I believe this is the first recorded miracle of Jesus. All right, so there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. They're probably poor, you know. So there's no wine for the marriage. And let me tell you something. I used to do perform weddings. Hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. And I'm not joking. I did weddings for probably at least 10 years. And I'll guarantee you 45 out of 52 weeks of every year I did a wedding. There was one day I did four weddings. There was a three-day weekend I did five weddings. Uh, hundreds of weddings. Hundreds of them. And everybody drinks wine at the weddings. So when you get the Baptist say, no, 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 Jesus didn't turn it into wine. It was grape juice. I'm sorry, Jesus didn't turn the water into Welch's grape juice. No, people drank wine. All right, so. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said, saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now remember, well, we'll get, well, uh, let me, I just want to, yeah, let me keep going here. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifest, manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So, verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. Uh, and, you know, people, everybody that drinks, okay, isn't that how it works? When people first arrive, you know, they have dinner or whatever, and then they start drinking, you put out the good stuff. And then afterwards, you put out the rot gut, you know, the, the stuff that's not as good, because everybody's drunk and, you know, you don't really notice it, you know, or you don't really care, you know. Uh, I wish everybody drank like I did. All the uh, you-know-who-owned liquor places would be out of business, but uh, that would be a real revival. So, marriage supper. Miracle, water to wine. Keep that in mind. All right, in Mark 14, uh, let's see, verse 22. Uh, this is the, the Lord's, the Last Supper, just before the crucifixion. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, not all, many. Verse 25, listen carefully. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine, until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. 
Ah, marriage supper of the Lamb. That's when he. That's the kingdom of God. When he puts his enemies under his feet and gets rid of this old corrupt earth, a new heavens and a new earth. Marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, you could do a whole Bible study on just the uh, the wedding, the marriage of the Lamb being reconciled with his old wife. Now, there's a verse in the Bible that says that uh, if a man divorces his wife, he can't go back to her. Well, if she goes to be with another man or whatever. Uh, once you divorce your wife and she goes to be with somebody else, or if you divorced her because of uncleanness, because she was messing around on you, uh, you couldn't go back to her. So, God was wanting a virgin bride, but he didn't get it. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. And uh, we're just going to look at verse 8. And if you want to read the whole chapter, you can. You could pause right here and then read it. Uh, the uh, bride was uh, messing around on her husband. Jeremiah 3, eight, And I saw a wind for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. What's adultery? Uh, adultery is a married person messing around on somebody that's uh, with, uh, messing around with somebody that's not their spouse. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God divorced Israel, people. I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Oh boy. So, God divorced Israel. But if you read that carefully, the Lord did not divorce Judah. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31 and verse 31, we read, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. Uh, Hebrew Roots people, here's a memo for you. It says new, not renewed. No, it's the new covenant. New covenant covenant n-e-w you know when you buy a new car okay you're not just taking the old car and replacing the engine and the transmission and putting a new coat of paint on it no it's still the old car okay when you buy a new car it's new it's not renewed the idiots they're idiots these hebrew roots people are idiots well, they're deceived fools or deceivers. I'm not sure which. Uh, the Lord will figure that one out, not me. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. They're not the same. Judah's part of Israel, but not all of Israel is Judah. All Texans are Americans, but not all Americans are Texans or New Yorkers. Go to Georgia and tell, every, tell them they're, they're a bunch of New York Yankees and uh, they might spit some tobacco chew in your face. Because that's kind of an insult. And after living with a bunch of New Yorkers, uh, of which 25% are of the you-know-who I understand. <laughs> so, I grew up in Miami. Miami's full of them. Yeah. Especially on the beach. Boy, I tell you what, you've never been cheated out of money until you've worked for them. Yeah. 
new covenant. Well, guess what, people? But there is a provision in the Bible that says when the husband or the wife dies, the spouse was free to remarry. Well, what happened to Christ on the cross? He died. Now, the bride is able to remarry. Uh, it's getting a little, yeah, but it's, it's, it's there. Israel's husband died. So now they can get a new husband. Christ in the resurrection, right? I know, that's kind of a stretch, but yeah. You know, sometimes there's a um, earthly... Uh, the Lord shows things on an earthly level, but they have a heavenly spiritual meaning. All right, let's go. Marriage Supper of the Lamb. All right, let's read Revelation chapter 19. Probably not the whole thing, but verse 1. And uh, we'll close this out. Revelation 19 and verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen! Alleluia! And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And a lot of people don't get it, but the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, you know, uh, read Galatians 3.29. There's only one bride. There's not a Jewish bride and then a Gentile church bride. There's one bride. You are either in Christ or you're not in Christ. There's not two brides. Uh, they, they, these churches like uh, John Hagee, the, their little dual covenant theology doesn't make any sense. I mean, people that read their Bible, it falls apart instantly. But uh, all those people do is they go listen to that glutton they want to listen to him, fine, I don't care. He puts out a video, and a quarter million people listen to it. I put out a video, maybe a hundred and something people listen to it. Whatever. And a lot of those are the same people asking me comment. well, comments. Not asking me questions, but comments. You know, whatever. Am I... Uh, Jealous? Absolutely not. Uh, what was that song? Uh, comes to mind. Uh, Alan Parsons Project. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be like you. I wouldn't want to be like you. I love that song when it came out in the 70s. Alan Parsons. He did uh, work for uh, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Uh, but I don't listen to much music anymore, so whatever. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, 
clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Ah, that's because they were washed white and clean in the blood of the Lamb. Right? Right. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Oh yeah. These are the true sayings of God. All right, I think we're going to close it out right here. I hope you uh, learned something. Uh, next, we're going to do tabernacles. Did you know that we're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in the Millennial Kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ when Satan is locked up? Oh, yeah. Maybe I'll cover that uh, children in the Millennial Reign of Christ. And maybe I'll cover a little bit about the uh, Ezekiel's temple. Yeah, there's going to be a temple in the kingdom. But it's not for believers. It's going to be for the, um, well, I suspect it's going to be for the children who were uh, died in childbirth and the aborted children. Uh, maybe I'll get into that the next uh, Bible study. I'll probably cover that because it's, yeah, I don't hear too many people, people don't, you know, I try to do Bible studies on stuff that people don't do, you know, so that's why I do all this kind of, uh, sometimes I do stuff that's obscure, I guess you could say, but, you know, but I, I, I try to equip the saints, and I know I've been doing a lot of end time study and I've been covering the same material but you know sometimes you need to hear the same thing a number of times because I'm telling you most of the church world is going to worship the beast they're going to do it they're going to take the mark in whatever form it is because they want to eat I remember when I was on a bulletin board um, like I don't know 18 years ago we used to have bulletin boards. Before there was fake fake book, there was bulletin boards, electronic bulletin, bulletin boards. And one woman, I remember she said, you know, I'm going to have to take the mark of the beast because i got to feed my children, and God will forgive me. And I was like, wow. Wow, that's using, you know, that's basically using your human reasoning to overturn where the Lord says that those that take the mark will be cast into the lake of fire. Instead, of, you're going to trust the world to feed your children instead of saying, nope, I'm not going to take the mark. If they catch me, they can cut my head off. Or if we're in the wilderness, the Lord will supply us with food. You know, manna from heaven, just like he did to Israel back in the Old Testament. You know? I mean, that's a, you know, uh, you think about it, that is a rejection of trusting in Christ. When you think about it, taking the mark of the beast, oh, I'm going to trust the world. As if Christ couldn't feed you in the wilderness. Why do you think uh, the book of Exodus was written? God supplied him in the desert with water and food. Their clothes didn't wear out. They, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and their shoes didn't wear out. I mean, come on, people. Food and raiment. That's the only thing the Lord pro uh, promises us in this life. Anything else is a bonus. You know? Think about it. Are you going to take the mark or are you going to trust the Lord? Either... If the Lord calls you to get your head cut off, that's what he calls you to do. Or if he calls you to go in the wilderness, Revelation chapter 12, the woman 
is the church, and the church is the woman, the bride of Christ. And she's going to flee into the wilderness. I, I don't know if I'll be called to do that. Uh, uh, maybe I'll die before it happens. Who knows? Either head cut off or who knows? I could have a heart attack tonight or a stroke. Kick the bucket. Probably make some, uh, some of the devil's children very happy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, have you ever noticed atheists, so-called, always come to Christian channels telling us how stupid we are. It's funny, they never go to Jewish websites and tell them how stupid they are or that if there is no God, well, then what happens to the claim of the land in the Middle East being theirs? If there's no God, then their claim to the land is null and void, which means, uh, you know, think about it. All right, listen, everybody. If you have um, a USB drive or an SD card and, that I sent you, um, if you send it back, and I'd appreciate it if you throw in a buck or two for postage. Um, it's not necessary, but it'd be appreciated. Um, listen, uh, send it back, and I will load all my new studies on it. And uh, you'll be up to date. Because uh, I think I've got possibly two or three more new studies. And that's going to be it for, I don't know, until the Lord puts his boot onto my rear end and gets me off my lazy behind to uh, do some more studies. Because every time I think that I'm going to uh, cut back for a while, something else comes to mind. So, but this uh, study on the feast days, I've been wanting to do this for years. But I knew it was going to be, uh, it was going to be fairly detailed. So, I just the marriage supper of the Lamb could be an entire Bible study by itself. So, but yeah, if you're interested in uh, children in the kingdom and where do they come from, if the believers are not having children, uh, I've got a Bible study on that where I covered that in, you know, maybe not in detail, but I cover it. And uh, pre-tribbers use that as an excuse for why the pre-trib rapture is true. Ugh. Boy, they, they I, I just don't get it, but I don't know. All right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.